Very nice to have you with us uh, today at the IMF. Uh, we are delighted to have, I think it's more than 100 uh, civil society organizations represented uh, on this call today with the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva. And uh, we look forward to taking as many questions today as possible so that we can have a, a very nice participatory open event. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping instructions and then we'll get right to it. Please, uh, if you are not speaking, please mute uh, your mic. That will help us all since we have so many people on the call. I'm going to ask Kristalina to make a few opening remarks and then we'll take your questions. If you have a question, please use the chat function and identify yourself by name and uh, by your organization. And um, please remember to turn on your camera as well because it will be lovely to see you. And um, with that, we will get right to it. I'm gonna ask Kristalina to uh, give us uh, some opening remarks just to set the table a bit and then we'll turn to your questions. Please, uh, if you will, keep your questions as uh, short as possible because that helps us to get to as many people as possible. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn to the Managing Director, to Kristalina, and uh, looking forward to this terrific discussion. Kristalina, over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jerry, and uh, welcome to all who are connecting on this uh, call. The um, disadvantage of a pandemic is that we cannot be in close proximity with each other, but the virtual call has the ability for more people to be able to uh, connect. Um, I want to start with the news of the day, which is the Nobel Peace Prize this year uh, went to the World Food Program. Um, very happy for the World Food Program. They certainly deserve it. But it is also symbolically telling us what is top of mind in this very daunting uh, time. And it is the fact that a crisis like no other is putting tremendous strain on hundreds of millions of people, but it is particularly harsh on those that stepped into the crisis from a position of weakness and are much more severely impacted by it. So where are we today? Uh, you will hear us um, very in the next, uh, next days, early next week, presenting our projections for the world economy. What we are going to say is that the situation is less dire than we saw it in June, but dire nonetheless. Uh, and we will uh, reflect on uh, where different parts of the world are and what are the big issues that we will be wrestling with. Top of mind is to focus on the health of people. As long as the pandemic is with us, the most dramatic impact is loss of lives and uh, uh, restricting the ability of people to look after themselves and their families. So focus on, on health systems uh, remains a top priority. Beyond that, what we want to see is a recognition that until we have a durable exit from the health crisis everywhere, we cannot rely on a full recovery anywhere. And therefore, extending support to workers and to, to firms, not withdrawing it prematurely, is at the heart of the advice we are going to give to our membership this week and next. And three, we have 
as always, at the time of a massive crisis, we have a unique chance to reform and restructure, make the world take a turn for the better. And that means, in our view, to concentrate on what have been problems with, with us even before the pandemic. What did we face then? We face low productivity, low growth, high and growing inequality, and a looming climate crisis. We, with the pandemic, got one positive, and it is acceleration of digitalization. Would that turn to be a factor to reduce inequalities, or it would turn to be a factor that put some further behind. So we are going to be arguing with our members that the opportunity is in front of us. We must grab it. And uh, if I were to say what, what makes me worry the most these days, it is what Dickens wrote about the tale of two cities. We are seeing those of us, me included, who can work from home inter interruptedly working. And we see those of us that are in uh, contact uh, industries losing their jobs, no prospects for easy recovery. We have to do all we can to not only put the floor under the world economy, but to make sure that we walk towards a better uh, tomorrow. And finally, what does it mean for us at the fund? In the first phase of this crisis, we acted decisively. We leaned forward with massive emergency financing. Never before we have done so much so fast. We are now up to 81 countries that have been funded, 76 out of them. Uh, with emergency financing of the uh, about 280 billion that we have extended from our, our one trillion dollars lending capacity, more than one third was done in this last uh, months. And uh, we have been very active on debt relief, not only lobbying others to do it, the G20 to come with the uh, debt service suspension initiative, but doing it ourselves by providing much needed uh, ease of the debt burden to our 29 poorest members. They don't pay us uh, while they're in the midst of this uh, crisis. We have expanded significantly uh, concessional capacity of the fund, and we will continue to work on getting our well-off members to give us a chance to use temporarily their SDRs to own land on concessional terms to those who need it. We are looking for the next phase of our engagement, and we have very active discussions on what would it mean for us to do our part to help the world not just go through this crisis, but come on the other side as a greener, fairer, and more sustainable, more inclusive, more resilient world. Uh, and on all this, we count on you on you, our eyes and ears, uh, on what is happening uh, on the ground. And you are putting pressure, including on us, to do the right thing, especially in this time of crisis. So thank you, and I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Kristalina. And uh, I see that we already are getting some questions online, so let's get right to it. I see, uh, let's take the first three uh, batch of questions, okay? And I see Liddy, I see Patricia, I see Sashwan. Uh, please, uh, Liddy. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed, the three crises, the multiple crises we're facing shines a very strong light on the continuing problem of debt and its impacts on economies and health systems of our countries. And uh, 
indeed, the IMF also responded very quickly with that debt relief package in April 2020, and so did the G20. However, our really major concern is that these packages are very short of what is immediately and urgently needed. Too little amounts, too few countries, and even with the G20, it's not even undertaking cancellation, just short-term suspension of payments. What is the IMF's current thinking on the prospects for broader, wider, and deeper debt cancellation, especially involving many more countries other than just the 29? And are there any processes by which civil society can actively and closely engage the IMF in dialogue about debt cancellation? Thank you very much, Liddy. And uh, let's hear from Patricia. Yes, good morning, and thank you very much for this space. Uh, we find it is valuable uh, that the IMF is emphasizing, uh, emphasizing on the importance of inequalities, human rights, social protection. Um, however, we are concerned about how the IMF is starting to apply new long-term austerity condition program. Even countries that are receiving resources from the emergency program are at the same time receiving advices on fiscal consolidation for the recovery phase. This can be a contradiction and it is a concern for, uh, for us and it has led to a letter that has been sent uh, to you, Cristalina, uh, against austerity measures uh, signed by more than uh, 500 CSOs and academics. I uh, hope that you had the chance to see it. Uh, there are many lessons learned from austerity measures and its social impacts, which can be really worst in a recovery that for many developing countries will be slow and long. The IMF can reverse an unequal recovery. Would the IMF change this approach to avoid the impacts of austerity measures? Well, thank you very much for that question, Patricia. Let's uh, turn uh, finally in this round to Sashwan. Hello, Sashwan, please come in. Hello, and good morning uh, to all of you. And Sashwan, we're not, can you, is there any way you could turn your volume up a bit, please? Sure. Good morning, can you hear me? Still very, very faint, Sashwan, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could, is there uh, any way you can turn up your volume? Uh, this is the maximum volume, but can you hear me better now? I'm raising. If you go mic. really close to it, then close. perhaps now we can make it better. work. Yep. Yep. Right. Stay, stay close yep. to the mic. I will. I will. So my question is that in some countries, in some developing countries, such as my own, Jordan, policies on home quarantine, homeschooling, or online schooling, and food security in general, landed on the shoulders of women which is not only exhausting, but negatively affecting their economic role. How can countries recover from widening the gender gap? Thank you. Thank you, Sashwan. <laughs> Kristalina, over to you, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Sashwan. Uh, great questions. And these are questions, uh, I can tell you, we spent a huge amount of, um, not just time, but energy to uh, to address. Uh, let me start with that. Um, what has been done by the G20 with the debt service suspension, suspension initiative is valuable because as economies were put in standstill, countries could rely on standstill in servicing their debt obligations. And I'm saying this because uh, credit should be given where credit is uh, due. Uh, for us uh, at the fund, uh, we, the, the, the um, grants we have provided to our uh, 29 poorest members meant that for the first six months, and now we extend it for another six months, this saves half a billion. In their case, in this particular case, it is written off. So they, you know, that's done. Uh, and 
while I agree with you, uh, uh, Lily, the uh, debt issue is much bigger, we need to, re to remember that there are some that do have access to markets with the pouring of liquidity from central banks and, and uh, fiscal authorities, majority of emerging markets with sound fundamentals returned to markets at very low cost, so they can borrow at very low interest rates. And it is a small group of countries, low-income countries, and some emerging markets that have already been in debt distress that cannot return, they, they are cut off. So it is actually appropriate to concentrate on those where access to financing is very limited or none. Uh, and I think we have to, you, you will see us engaged on this issue of debt. Uh, it is our priority for the meetings. We put out, I don't know whether people have seen it, but we put out a um, strategy for further improving the international debt architecture. And we concentrate on, one, making sure that debt is sustainable. And if it is not, that debt is restructured in a timely manner. So that the debt burden is, is, is brought down. As, as you said, Lily, that does mean cutting uh, the debt down. Uh, and two, that there is full participation of everybody under comp compatible conditions. And that is work to be, to be done on the private sector side, on how we bring all official um, creditors to adapt a um, common approach to how they engage on issues of, of debt sustainability. And of course, for us at the fund, how we use our ability to assess whether that is sustainable or not, and to encourage and facilitate early action. Uh, now, you're right to say there may be a bigger need for action on that. I agree with you, and this I can tell you we would be watching this very closely. We also have to be mindful that money has opportunity cost. If we use money to write off debt, we won't have that same money to invest in the future of countries. So we have to we have to work hard to prioritize action, knowing that we are for a long haul. I just gave uh, my um, pre-annual meeting speech, and the term we crafted was the long ascent. We are going to climb a difficult mountain. We are connected by by one single rope. We have to help the climbers that are facing difficulty on the way up uh, and uh, in, do that in, the, in, a, in, a, in a very focused and, and, and a very engaged manner. How you can help do participate with your ideas, especially zeroing on where you see that uh, action must be taken and it is being delayed. Too little, too late. This is one of the biggest enemies we have in dealing with, uh, with, the, uh, with the issue of debt. Uh, uh, Patricia, uh, so we uh, repeat that over again. This is an exogenous shock. It is hitting countries not because they have been, many of them have done anything wrong. Well, we all have done something wrong. We have not prepared for the pandemic, but this is a separate, separate story. It is not bad economic management that got us where we are. And not very different from the Great Depression. We cannot get out of it by cutting the lifelines on which we depend. So the IMF has been very loud and clear in this crisis, turning to our membership, and we say, spend, but keep the receipts. And we are saying that because we believe that there has to be a floor under the world economy, 
but also that there has to be a strategy for how we are going to make space for restructuring towards greener um, digital smart of way of, of ensuring uh, that growth returns and is, is sustained. Now, why do you hear us talking about medium-term fiscal consolidation? Because we are financing this how? Debt and deficits. And these are not things that, that are particularly helpful for sustainable uh, growth. So over time, what we want is to see a uh, modernization of tax systems that allow us to get more revenues by not only distributing the debt uh, uh, responsibilities in a more equitable manner, but also by eliminating loopholes, moving taxation to where it matters the most, where it is most effective, like tax, taxing capital is better than taxing labor. Taxing carbon is something that, that needs to be done. Well, pricing carbon may not be exactly taxed. So we have to think about how we raise revenues. And let's remember there are countries where today the uh, tax-to-GDP ratio is really, really not where it should be. How could... I'm not going to name countries. I love all, all our members, but in some countries, under 10% tax-to-GDP, we are saying it has to be at least 15%. At least. Yeah, otherwise, you cannot fund education and health and all your social expenditures. So you will hear us talking about fiscal matters, but we emphasize medium term and we emphasize balancing the revenues and then improving the quality of the expenditures, uh, not tightening up at a time when this is going to uh, be counterproductive. And finally, on the issue of women, I, um, uh, uh, I'm very glad that you managed to speak close to the mic so we can hear you. This is really hugely important. We are faced with a very dangerous climb up of inequalities of all kinds. Among them, gender inequality. What we have made as progress over the last decades can be easily lost. We know this crisis hits women more than it hits men. They are more in the contact uh, dependent sectors. They do most of the work at home, as you said, and now the work at home has increased. They are being cut off labor markets more than, than, than men. And unfortunately, we see gender-based violence going up. So what can be done? Uh, yesterday, we had the presentation of a great book on making the invisible visible. We, first and foremost, need gender disaggregated data. Women have to be visible. Um, uh, Melinda, M Melinda Gates talk a lot, talks a lot about it. We are going to have an event with her on this topic. And then secondly, we need policies that zero on reducing inequality, including gender inequality. And where the fund has a role to play is in uh, making sure that we have gender-based budgeting that access to finance is uh, actually prioritizes uh, women. We know, especially uh, in SMEs, women are more reliable. Uh, we know women in many places are better business people. Actually, uh, in some parts of the world, uh, evidence shows that, that women outperform men as entrepreneurs, and yet that they have many times less access to finance. So we have to be fixing these problems. Uh, and of course, there are very important issues on public spending in terms of child care, uh, easing, easing the burden on, on uh, everybody, but especially on, on women. And uh, uh, do speak up about it. I, I personally believe that we empower women, we would get faster through this crisis. By Thank the way, another, another piece of news. 
the first woman to lead a multilateral development bank was appointed yesterday. Uh, Odile uh, is now the president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The community of women in finance is growing. Thank you, Kristalina. Good news. Uh, look, let's turn to the next uh, three questions. And I see uh, on my screen Chennai from the Tax Justice Network. I see Andre from Transparency International. And I see Jenny from the Fight Inequality Alliance. So Chennai, Andre, and Jenny, please, Chennai. Thanks so much, Jerry. Hi, Kristalina. Thanks so much for this platform. Um, I think I had a question. I think I had a question. Something that you said earlier. Said earlier. Said earlier. Can you hear me? Thing, uh, some echo there, Chennai. Why don't you Why don't you try again, please? Okay. So, okay. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Much Much go, better. Go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, perfect. Um, so this question builds, I think, on one of the answers you gave earlier. The devastating impacts, I think, that we've seen of COVID-19, I think, can't be understated. Um, but according to experts, we can expect to see more of these kinds of pandemics in the near future. And so because of that, I think our focus needs to be not just on recovery, but on resilience as well. So my question was, what kind of support can we expect to see the IMF give um, particularly to developing countries to, to build resilience um, in a way that prioritizes human livelihoods so that they're better prepared for, for the next crisis. Uh, Jerry, do we go straight in answering or yes, collecting? No, oh, no, okay. Kristalina, okay, uh, we're going tonight. to go to Andre. Andre, please, uh, next. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question, of course, will be again about the COVID-19 challenges. So um, currently the emergency financing deployed since the start of the pandemic is characterized by speed and flexibility. Yet the IMF's response to COVID-19 has shown that it is feasible to include specific governance and anti-corruption safeguards in uh, emergency loan agreements. But for example, in Ukraine, um, has Ukraine has received 2.1 billion through the new standby program aiming to help Ukraine to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic challenges. However, most of the funds uh, from the in-country COVID-19 uh, fund established by the government were spent on road construction, police uh, support, and, and not even one lungs ventilator was bought. Are there any measures planned to address these governance issues in Ukraine and other countries? And my second part of the question is also in order to help to prevent the misuse of IMF funds and address the lack of consistency of anti-corruption measures in emergency financing that the IMF itself has recently recognized, uh, is the fund considering amending its 2011 uh, policy on liquidity and emergency financial assistance? Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Let's take another question from Jenny, and then we'll turn back to Kristalina. Jenny, please. Thank you very much. Um, so as you've said, Kristalina, we are facing the biggest single increase in inequality since the Great Depression. And the gap between the rich and the poor is going to increase in every single country on Earth at the same time. So we know it requires unprecedented action, and we know that that means massive redistribution. So my question is to you is, will you and the IMF back wealth taxes and solidarity taxes so that the richest pay their fair share? Uh, back to me, yes. Thank you, Kristalina. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so very, uh, very good questions again. Um, in uh, in framing the um, way we are, how we are thinking about uh, uh, th these questions, they are actually uh, uh, <laughs> related. Um, uh, 
uh, with one another. Um, first, we recognize that the world is becoming more shock prone. It is changing very rapidly. We are interconnected. There are many more of us. And yet, we do not have a um, resilience crisis prevention mindset. And our policies fall short of this shock-prone world we are living in. So what it means for the fund is a recognition that building resilience is as important in a broader sense as it is in terms of building financial resilience. Let's remember after the uh, uh, 2008 financial crisis, there has been a lot of regulatory improvement to make the banking sector more resilient to financial shocks. And we see it today, it works. The banking sector is holding relatively well. It doesn't mean that financial stability should be taken for granted. And we see that in the non-banking financial institutions, there is more risk. So what does it mean if we are to build resilience in a broader sense? Well, first, it means resilient people investing in health, education, social protection. Uh, we, it is so very clear in this pandemic that uh, countries that have universal access to uh, uh, universal uh, health coverage, they're, they're doing better. So, and, and of course, uh, building resilience in terms of uh, people being agile to structural change so they can more easily move from one job to another, it is part of resilience. Uh, second, we have to think of the resilience of nature. Uh, climate shocks are already uh, hitting. They will be more frequent and they will be more severe. We can invest in reforestation, land degradation uh, improvements, in uh, reducing emissions. All of this is job creating. It is also enhancing the resilience of ecosystems, of nature. And third, we need resilient institutions that are agile and adaptable. And uh, that applies also to the IMF. So we can anticipate, act early, and of course, target the most vulnerable, most vulnerable in different consequences. So it goes beyond resilience to pandemic. It goes into that concept of more resilient communities, more resilient uh, societies. And of course, more equitable societies are more resilient. Um, let me, let me um, if you don't mind, I will switch a bit the order. Let me talk about this issue of inequality and why we, sh we must be concerned and we must be focused on what can be done. Uh, Research of the IMF shows that after, after every pandemic, after SARS, after H1N1, after Zika, inequality increases. The low-skilled uh, skills people get into an unemployment that lasts longer. And we know that uh, this crisis is, uh, is very dramatic. Therefore, we do need to think of ways in which those that are benefited for the massive financial support uh, coming coming to, to, to help the economy stabilize, and also those that are the winners of this uh, 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 crisis, those who can do more to help societies be more resilient uh, to do it. And I, when you ask about uh, uh, taxation, yes, we believe that there is space for making the uh, tax burden more equitably, 
shared. Uh, there are many who say, oh, if you go into more redistributional impact of taxation, that would impact growth. In most cases, this is not simply not true. And we want to see thinking of taxation in, in a way that uh, helps the world, helps the economy transition, including to low carbon, climate resilient development. Uh, we, how, how we, what, what terminology we use, that is a separate me uh, 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 matter. And uh, of course we can, we can define the, the terms, but the concept of sharing the benefits and the risks in a more effective way than we do today, this concept clearly has to be put front and center. And uh, in our engagement with the membership, we do make this case very, very clearly. Uh, now, let me go to another issue that is, uh, and by the way, if you take Tax systems, it's not even, it's not only the redistribution of, uh, of taxation, but then there's so many systems that are outdated. They built all, all kinds of uh, um, special treatments that might have been smart at the time that was done, but outlive the, 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 their usefulness and yet they cannot be uh, uh, touched. Now, uh, needless to say, uh, uh, Jenny, this is uh, is going to be a big, big uh, wrestling match around these issues, uh, and uh, you can be extremely helpful by rationally talking about the um, value for everyone by having more vibrant, more dynamic, more productive uh, societies. Um, how are we going to get? out of this if education fails 20 to 50 percent of people how is this going to happen uh, so I, I i i think you get my 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 view uh, we are very aligned where where we are uh, uh, concentrated is to say uh, taxation needs to be brought up in the 21st century there are parts of the economy that didn't exist before now they're the drivers of growth and yet how do we do with uh, 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 deal with digital taxation this is this is a very open uh, uh, question so it's not only about uh, different income levels it is also about uh, the uh, structural change in the economy and taxation not yet quite catching uh, uh, up uh, on the uh, on the uh, question of safeguards uh, um, uh, andre uh, we have done uh, the following. In the emergency financing, we are asking only two things. We are asking priority to be given to the health systems and to helping the most vulnerable people and parts of the economy. And two, we are asking for reporting on how the money is uh, used. We are asking for transparency in procurement and we are asking for the receipts to be, to be, to be uh, uh, available and audited. Uh, Ukraine is, uh, is not an emergency financing. It is the traditional um, IMF program. This doesn't mean that we are not interested in how the money is being used. And uh, you would see, I'm sure you know from the um, uh, from following up that uh, we uh, have a uh, constructive uh, engagement with the uh, with the uh, uh, authorities uh, of Ukraine, and it is also an engagement in which we do want to see the right things being uh, being done. Um, so let me stop. Uh, 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 oh, and you asked me whether we we would um, uh, revisit the policy. Yes, we do reviews of our policies on a regular uh, basis. Uh, right now, we are more concentrated on whether we have the the, the right lending instruments for the ne next phase of this uh, uh, crisis, uh, for the recovery uh, phase. Uh, but of course, uh, we are going to look into uh, how the uh, emergency uh, lending policy has served us and what might need to be um, further improved. 
Thank you Make very much, Kristalina. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn to John from the Bank Information Center, uh, Dalia from uh, Morocco, and uh, I'm seeing Muat from uh, Lawyers Without uh, Borders. Okay, so uh, John, uh, uh, John, Dalia, and uh, Muat, uh, please. John. Hi, everyone. I'm John Sword with the Burton Woods Project. Center. I wanted to ask um, a question around uh, specifically how the IMF is planning to adapt its country surveillance work uh, to ensure countries can tackle so-called transition risks to climate change. Mm -hmm. So as part of the COVID crisis, we've seen a sort of rapid change in global energy markets with, with even BP now predicting that 2019 may have been the, the peak of global fossil fuel demand. Um, and as well, the EU's new proposed 2030 emissions reduction target could potentially lower its gas demand by around 30%. Uh, so clearly this is a rapidly changing landscape. Um, so it'd be great to hear a bit about the fund's plans in this area. And just to flag as well, it's a particular concern to civil society that um, a, a work, World Bank working paper published last month showed the IMF has consistently been overestimating future growth from oil and gas discoveries in Africa, this pre-course pre uh, curse paper. Mm -hmm. So I um, would welcome your thoughts yep. on this sort of wider landscape. Yep. Obviously, we're keen that these risks aren't ignored, but at the same time, we want the fund to be ensuring that member countries have the necessary fiscal space to implement their NDCs and ultimately to transition to um, a zero carbon future. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thanks to everybody for keeping these uh, questions very succinct. We're going to turn to Dalia, who's with us from Morocco. Dalia, are you there, please? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dalila from Morocco. I'm the president of Women of Morocco Democratic Association. And we are very pleased, really very pleased, uh, to see this new face of the IMF uh, turning toward the civil society, because we still believe that an economic growth is still possible and uh, still be co uh, in, con in conjunction with the human well-being and a fair conditions for living for men and women along together. I don't know if this, the, the reason for that is that we are seeing more women uh, at, the, at, at the head of financial institution, and we are very proud of the IMF too for having Mrs. Kristalina. Thank you very much for turning to us to the civil society to listen to our problems. So uh, I would like, my question is about the fact that uh, we know that IMF has given uh, um, an emergency financing for Morocco. And we, we would like to know if the IMF has included any gender issue in, uh, or indicators in the accountability mechanism when supporting our country for post-COVID post resilience. Uh, as you may know, and you have already actually mentioned, mentioned it, women are the most vulnerable uh, to, in, within the time of crisis, and it is, is particularly true in Morocco. And we we don't have, I mean, there are many women living in and working in the informal sector, and they couldn't have any kind of uh, protection, uh, uh, social protection, or access the right to this uh, protection, social protection. So we will be very much interested in knowing how IMF could have an accountability indicator of this, this uh, lines of financing to countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dalila. And uh, let's take a question from Muath, uh, lawyers yes, with thank the you. borders. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. This is Muath. Uh, I'm a legal advisor with Lawyers Without Borders in Jordan. Uh, I have many concerns and uh, many questions about uh, and uh, about if there is any policy will take place regarding the, the IMF's policies uh, in this crisis to stop human rights violation. 
could happen in any country and how can we as a civil society's organization help whole parties and civic space to take a place and doing their role in their societies thank you well thank you very thank much you. uh Kristalina, over to you please thank you uh, uh, John, uh, thank you very much for uh, zeroing on the uh, question of uh, uh, transition more broadly, not only transitional risks, but how we are going to make that shift from uh, a higher carbon intensity to low carbon intensity, and uh, uh, how we are going to help countries be more resilient to climate uh, shocks, so beyond, beyond uh, the uh, mitigation side. Uh, we uh, have established um, very strong uh, research in the area of climate to inform both surveillance and our program work. We see climate as macro-critical issue of tremendous significance for, for the very survival, survival of all of us, but also for the um, uh, growth and prosperity in the future. Uh, and I can tell you that it has not been an easy uh, discussion. There are still some who think that uh, this is not for the fund. Fund needs to focus on financial stability, and that's it. And uh, so I, I spent a lot of time explaining that you cannot have financial stability without environmental and social sustainability, and that uh, uh, the, uh, the issue of climate is uh, front and center for us. What does it mean? We concentrate on two sets of issues. First, the issue of risk, both transitional risk and the risk of shocks caused by climate change. And what we want is to be on the front line of linking these risks to financial stability. We made a commitment during the spring meetings, I spoke about that, to integrate this analysis in our financial uh, assessments, financial sector ass assessment reports. And so we are working on how can we have stress tests incorporated in the more traditional stress testing. Not everybody knows, but it was the fund that invented stress tests for the banking sector. How can we integrate climate risks? Uh, and uh, as we learn how to do that, and obviously this is learning by doing uh, that, that is not a one shot, it is a process. Uh, that would become uh, a um, global public good contribution to how, how this issue is being addressed. Secondly, you're very uh, right to point to surveillance. Uh, we have uh, worked on a conceptual framework of what is the policy approach to mitigating uh, climate uh, risks. And so we published this conceptual framework in, the, uh, in chapter three of the World Economic Outlook. And I do recommend for you to, uh, to look into this chapter. It basically says we need a triage. We need three things. We need to use the uh, uh, stimulus that is going to be deployed to uh, prompt up the economy to be a green stimulus to, to direct money into low carbon intensity transition. Second, we need to have forward guidance on carbon price with gradually increasing a carbon price as a signal to move out of high, high carbon intensity to low carbon intensity. And third, it has to be a just transition. We have to use part of the revenues from carbon to direct to sectors and people that are negatively impacted. Now, this is the framework. And then what we want is in surveillance to go down to a country level, what does it mean in different countries' uh, contexts? I don't, 
I am not yet making the same announcement I made for the um, FSAPs on surveillance because we, we need to equip our teams to be able to do this work and we are partnering with other, other institutions to accelerate it. But I can tell you that for countries that are at high risk of climate shocks and for countries that are uh, high emitters, they are our priority in surveillance ter terms to move uh, more, more uh, rapidly. Uh, yes, we, uh, I accept your criticism on overestimating the benefits done in the past in, uh, in uh, investments in uh, uh, um, fossil fuels. Uh, that is a f very fair criticism. I mean, one, obviously I can say that that was not just the fund, that it was the whole world being behind. We are not going to be behind, uh, John. We are going to be uh, front and center. We recognize our responsibility as an institution concentrated on good economic uh, policy. Um, and uh, do help us, <laughs> do help us, because uh, we do need to expand the understanding that this is macro critical. Uh, you know, helps a little bit that the, uh, the, the head of the IMF is an environmental economist. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it helps, but it is not enough. Uh, we need that relentless pursuit of the uh, uh, economic case uh, for, for action. Uh, on, the, uh, on the question on um, um, Dalila's question, uh, question the uh, uh, actions we have taken specifically in uh, overall in emergency financing and specifically in, Mor in Morocco. Uh, we have asked for targeting the most vulnerable. Clearly, women are more vulnerable. And we have asked for ability to audit how money is spent. But Dalila, uh, I must admit, we are in a, in a difficult place because of lack of data. And this is why the fund is taking very seriously to help countries have this aggregated data so we can actually target more effectively. So we see in some places we do better than in others. Uh, I must admit, I don't know the answer for Morocco. I will make sure to follow up with you to tell you whether Morocco is among the better uh, uh, cases or not. Uh, but we have to continue to, to improve our ability to target support to women in the most appropriate manner. And we cannot do it if, me, if women are invisible, if, if we have a world that is designed for men uh, and, and we, can't, we can't do that job uh, so well. Uh, and finally, on, uh, uh, on uh, human rights uh, violations, why do they matter uh, for everybody and they matter for the, uh, for the fund? Because when, when a society uh, has uh, uh, an injustice and inequality uh, embedded, that means that it is not as vibrant as it can be. It cannot reach its full potential. Uh, we, we are um, in this area much, much dependent on you, on civil society organizations. Uh, as you know, the IMF is uh, um, not very decentralized. We have rep local representatives, but not a lot of uh, people who are in the countries uh, and uh, we rely on civil society a lot to better understand what is happening in, in different places. And we do want, I mean, we engage with you because we are partners, but also because we want to reinforce your standing, your strength, and we rely on you, uh, on what you can uh, tell us. Thank you very much, Kristalina. This will be probably the last uh, round we'll take. So uh, let's take another group of questions. And I see Anne from uh, Anne Fisherman from Public Eye, uh, Switzerland. I see Martha, uh, da Martha Guerrero uh, from Refugee International. I see Aldo uh, Calilari from Jubilee uh, USA. So let's, uh, let's take these uh, group of questions from Anne, from Martha, and from Aldo, and uh, 
we'll see where we are on the time at the end. Uh, we might be able to squeeze in one more, but uh, let's see where we are. Anne, please come in. And thank you very much uh, for hearing us today. Um, dear Mrs. Georgieva, you have raised the alarm bell on numerous occasions uh, since the start of the COVID crisis on the increasing debt burden faced by many countries worldwide, and you've called for an increase in debt transparency. And an important factor that explained the increase in debt levels of certain countries in Africa in particular relates to resource-backed loans. And most of the time, there is very little transparency in these arrangements, and they only come to light once a country is in a situation of debt distress. So my question is, what can be done to improve transparency and also ensure participation of this type of creditors, the commodity traders, in debt relief? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Martha, are you there? Martha Guerrero from Refugee. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation. It has been very, um, it has uh, provided a lot of good information for us. But I want to talk about an issue that is not often included in IMF conversations, and that is uh, refugees. It was very pleasant to know that the World Economic Outlook did include vulnerable populations and uh, acknowledge the intergenerational effect of the pandemic in the most vulnerable. But I wonder if the IMS, IMF is planning to um, target refugees or include refugees in its uh, disaggregated data analysis, and if you're planning to uh, include them in accountability measures for those investments within host communities. Thank you very much, Martha. Let's, uh, let's hear from Aldo, please, Aldo, with the Jubilee USA. Yes, uh, hello, good morning to everybody. Um, so my question is about special drawing rights. Uh, so this remains uh, a surprisingly underutilized tool to, uh, uh, among the tools that could be used to respond to the crisis so far. Uh, we know there are limitations in terms of the support uh, from the amount of the, the percentage of members that need to uh, support it uh, uh, for it to, to be used more. Uh, however, uh, what more could the IMF be doing to promote its greater use? Uh, could the IMF... Uh, uh, be more forceful making the analytical case to show the need for a new issuance. And also, uh, there are no technical limitations uh, for advanced economies to use SDRs to replenish the uh, CCRT. Uh, could the IMF uh, just, you know, in the same way that it's encouraging members to uh, use SDRs to uh, uh, replenish the PRGT, also encourage them to use SDRs uh, that are not they are not use, using to replenish the CCRT, and then the CCRT could actually provide relief um, to more the, than the 29 countries that it is uh, currently supporting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aldo. Uh, Kristalina, if it's okay, I'm going to take one more question this yep, round, sure. and this will be the last question. Yep. But it's a, it's a good question and a, an important topic. It's from Lindsay Marchesol, and uh, Lindsay is with the Open Contracting Partnership. And she's asking about the space for discussion and uh, the role of civil society organizations. Lindsay, would you like to ask your question? We'll make this the last, then we'll turn to Kristalina for answers. Lindsay, are you there? The dark and very quiet because my whole family is asleep upstairs. <laughs> but thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, the, it was wonderful to hear about how the, the IMF has required more transparency of procurement as part of the emergency financing. And some of the points in the discussion in the chat were about how the IMF can help uh, increase the role of civil society, empower civil society to help to monitor the implementation of these uh, commitments. And of course, we are hoping that the IMF will continue to embed uh, these types of requirements and commitments in, in larger recovery programs. Well, thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, Kristalina, over to you now, and this will be the concluding round. Thanks yep. very much to you and to everyone. Uh, so I, uh, I, I very much uh, like uh, Anne's uh, um, focus on debt transparency. Uh, it is a big part of the uh, uh, 
uh, proposal we have made to improve the international debt architecture, to be more inclusive and uh, to bring creditors in a, a, a broad, to be more inclusive of who is at the table, but also to insist on adopting standards for transparency that allow everybody to see what is the debt uh, level and what is the debt structure. You talked about uh, uh, contracts uh, that are uh, linked to uh, commodities. Uh, we have seen a big increase in these kinds of um, uh, pre-set guarantees against non-payment that sometimes are, are making it extremely difficult for, for countries to restructure their uh, debt when this, this becomes necessary. Uh, what we want is to bring that uh, conversations forward on three topics. One is on uh, transparency, as you said. We work very uh, closely with the World Bank. The World Bank actually has taken a big step forward in uh, um, uh, debt data disclosure, uh, and we, we will continue to work uh, on that. Secondly, on inclusiveness to make sure that private sector participates, that, that different parts of private sector participate, and third, to get into a place where what has worked, like um, um, CACs have worked, is further improved to work even better. So we, it, in other words, there are issues that have not been solved, like uh, full inclusiveness, uh, private sector participation, and there are issues that have been partially solved and we can make further further progress. Uh, it is going to be a long haul. I just want to be very uh, uh, frank that uh, uh, the low hanging fruit around debt by and large has been picked up. Maybe not all, but big, big chunk. So we have to work uh, and we need on one side governments on board, political commitment from governments, and on the other side, we need to get uh, the enlightened private sector leadership to be more active in steering the way uh, for participation. Let's be very um, open here. There are people they are in the, in the business community, majority are with, with good intentions and good consciousness, but there are cases when uh, uh, corruption uh, is uh, rampant and uh, uh, all this lack of transparency and strange contracts, uh, uh, they, they, are, they are grounded in, in, in that. So the broader uh, question of uh, addressing corruption, improving overall government transparency, improving private sector transparency, uh, they all have to be part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, solution. And uh, we will be very keen to work with you, to work with civil society on that. Um, on refugees, um, uh, let, me, let me first say something that I should have stressed more in the very beginning. We, the IMF, at the IMF, we recognize that countries that are at highest risk of all kinds of distress tend to be fragile countries, and very often this fragility is also linked to either conflicts and natural disasters that lead to displacements, internal displacement, as well as across uh, uh, borders. At the IMF, we recognize that we need to step up significantly our work with fragile states, not only because Unfortunately, their numbers are not shrinking, but also because how can we have effective programs 
in countries that are either themselves fragile or are in the neighborhood of fragile countries with spillover impacts if we don't un understand well all the issues, including the issue of displacement. Uh, recently, in the program for Jordan, we actually included the issue of refugees. Uh, and uh, we are in discussions uh, with uh, both the World Bank, that has a very strong uh, um, fragility and conflict program, and with the relevant agencies. I was recently in Geneva. I met with Filippo uh, Grande, who is a good friend. Uh, and what we agreed is that we are going to have a, um, a small group of leaders in this community that understand these uh, issues well to help the fund formulate a more inclusive uh, strategy uh, for the future. And finally, on SDRs. Uh, so where, where we are is as follows. Uh, in March, April, I can tell you I was losing sleep over the risks to financial stability and the abrupt closing of markets for emerging uh, uh, economies, developing countries. And at that time, in March, actually, I, I put forward a proposal for a new SDR allocation. It is now somewhat different situation in which for majority of countries with good fundamentals, markets are open, they function. So that pre and uh, major central banks have opened up swap lines. This is easing the pressure uh, that otherwise would have been uh, uh, very, very strong for a new SDR allocation to be done very rapidly. That doesn't mean that the issue is off the table altogether. We don't know how the, uh, the future would evolve. We don't know what is going to happen when these swap lines are closed down, if they are closed down. And therefore, you're right uh, uh, to, to, to stress on that, uh, to tell us you have to do more uh, research. We are looking into, into the issue. We are looking into what to do with the fact that, indeed, a new SDR allocation would give 60% of the SDRs to countries that don't need it. How do we handle that? And it's not a, it's not a trivial uh, matter. In meanwhile, uh, what we are concentrated on is indeed using existing SDRs in the hands of countries that don't need it to, sh to shift it to the countries that need it. And we have been quite successful. We continue to pursue it. Uh, we set the target. We exceeded the target. Uh, now we are uh, aiming to do, uh, to do more. How would that link to the... Uh, uh, Catastrophe Containment and Relief Trust. We actually haven't been thinking about, about that because for the trust we need grants. And SDRs, they're loaned. They cannot be granted. Uh, but it is an interesting idea to see whether we can do something in that universe, uh, and, and I certainly would follow uh, up on it. Um, and finally, to Lindsay, I, am, I, am, I hope your family is still asleep. We, haven't woken them uh, up. Um, my uh, my 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 take is that uh, uh, the best way we can expand the space for discussion is by acting upon it. I can tell you, I encourage my 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 colleagues at all levels to be open and inclusive. And uh, I believe that uh, in a world of high uncertainty, there is no way we would find the right, the right path without having very open mind and, uh, and uh, 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 consulting very broadly. Neither would our decisions be acceptable uh, if there is no up and down ownership built of these uh, decisions, and you know they have to be, they, it has to be uh, 
it, it has to be a, a world in which we recognize that only together we can handle the uh, tremendous challenges we, we face. Uh, so uh, with, uh, with us at the fund, you have an open door. And uh, uh, I think uh, we, the, the very best way we can help civil society is by being visible to everybody that we respect and listen to the voice of civil society. Doesn't mean we would always agree, but we would always listen carefully to what you, you have to say, and we would make sure that it is for everybody uh, to see. I, let me finish with this. Uh, early in my in my work um, at the, when I when I was uh, newly recruited staff at the World Bank, uh, I was working on environment actually on a very important program to phase out leaded gasoline in Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, so kids could be smarter. And what I realized was that the power of the institution is it can bring the voices of people in the high corridors of power. That this access we have to heads of states, to ministries of finance, it is not for us. It is not just for our opinions. It is for the voice of those that may otherwise not be as effective in spending time, hours, with key decision makers, and I and I carry this lesson with me all the way to uh, now heading the IMF. Kristalina, thank, thank thank you so much. Thank you, Kristalina, for your time. Thanks to all colleagues on this call from all over the world. We really appreciate your participation. We look forward to continuing this, the discussion as our annual meetings continue uh, into next week. We are finishing bang on time. Thanks to you all again. Thank you, Kristalina. See Thank you, you all soon. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>